you really train yourself to get in a mindset when you're out conducting a mission, and then when you come back, you decompress. I think that's where, and you see that in the paper with post-traumatic stress disorder and those sorts of things, because it's this, do we have enough time to decompress? I don't know. I, I know for sure when you're in theater, you absolutely don't, because you're working 12, 15, or more hour days, you're getting some sleep, and you're back at it again the next day. You're on a patrol today, you come back, you're getting ready for the next the mission the next day. And so it's this constant state of readiness that you need to be in. And we do our best to get soldiers time to decompress, but it's not easy. Because they're thinking too, especially if something's happened, which on, in 0506 it was all the time. And anytime patrol's out, if you went out and there wasn't some type of attack, whether it was small arms fire, IED, whatever, it was an anomaly, unfortunately. This last deployment, not the case. And we almost got to the point where you, which was good, but you didn't expect to have contact. And so you could almost, we were fighting a little bit of complacency, the second deployment, because you, you just weren't used to coming under fire. And so soldiers may or may not have been rehearsing those battle drills as much as they were, for sure, the first time, because the first time, you knew you were going to have one of the four things that we'd rehearsed before we left the compound. The second time, nine times out of ten, you were going out and coming back, just talking to people and checking on things and doing the things that you need to accomplish. So, and then I think the last thing under mental physical toughness was just keeping the pressure on all the time. You know, winning the fourth quarter, as we think about in football in particular. But that is so true over there as well. You know, I saw this last deployment was we went in, we had a huge operation to take out the Shi insurgent groups. And there were a lot of hot pockets in within Baghdad. We had really taken care of the Sunni, Al-Qaeda, Sunni dominated insurgent groups in Al-Qaeda in Baghdad. I mean, they were no longer really a big threat. Occasionally they'd do something. But it was the Shia insurgent groups that weren't happy with the government that were really starting to rise up. A lot of them were uh, Sadr's followers, if you know Muqtad al-Sadr in Iraq. Well, we had a huge combined operation throughout Bag, throughout Iraq, and in particular in Baghdad, to really squelch that movement. And then it was, we drove a lot of the leadership out of the country. A lot of them went over to Iran. And then we put this full court press on the population centers that were harboring those groups. And we just dominated the terrain. And we made it so hard for those leaders to get back in to the country, and then in particular into those neighborhoods where they used to be able to operate, that we really took away that threat for the most part. But, but your soldiers, I mean, we had three or four or five very heavy weeks of pretty kinetic contact and operations. And so you come out of that, and you're like physically and mentally tired, but it was, this is the perfect opportunity to seize the initiative and maintain the momentum because they are at their weakest point and we need to continue to maintain the pressure. And so we did, and it just happened to be that that was in July and August, which is 120 plus degrees over there. But it was just this relentless pressure, and they could never really get in and reestablish, even when they wanted to. And we, would, we knew, it was, this is kind of neat, we would know through different intelligence sources when their leadership was coming back. And so they would come back and that night, we would have billboards put up, and they would say, like, hey, we know you're back. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. We'd drop leaflets on those neighborhoods because we knew exactly where they were. And then it was just amazing because then that word travels, and the other guy who was thinking about coming back the next week is like, holy shit, I don't know. About <laughs> so, but it was just that relentless pressure and kind of win in the fourth quarter. Just when you think it's time to you know, take a break, you can't. you got to just keep it going and moving toward, otherwise you lose some of that ground that you fought so hardly to gain. I, that's really all that I had. I guess I will leave you with one, um, two, one quote that I kind of live by, it's by Vincent Barty. Uh, Any man's finest hour is that moment when he has worked his heart out for a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle victorious. I mean, to me, that encompasses all the things that, that we just talked about. And then one gentleman in particular, Greg Gadsden, who you may or may not have heard about Greg Gatson. He was a 
phenomenal football player here at Army. He graduated in 1988. He was the anchor. He was a defensive end. Uh, that team went 9-2, and two, won the Commander Chiefs Trophy, lost the heartbreaker, one-point loss to Alabama in the Sun Bowl. And Greg went on to become a battalion commander over in Iraq, in Baghdad. And he got hit by a roadside bomb. I know exactly, I mean, I can picture it because I drove that route a million times. I mean, know exactly the spot where he was hit and lost both of his legs. I mean, he thought of another buddy of ours who was on that same football team was a special forces guy who was in Baghdad doing combined operations with that brigade. Actually met Greg at the combat support hospital there in Baghdad and then flew with them all the way back to the States. And he was sending us little updates. He couldn't really tell us, but 98 was Greg's number. So he's like, not, he was giving us 98 updates. So we knew kind of how Greg was doing it. It didn't look very good. I mean, he thought initially Greg was going to lose his life. That was in May of 07. I came here. I was on my way back to Iraq. I came here in July for our annual football reunion, and Greg was here. I mean, this is two months after he was hit with an IED in Iraq, lost both legs. He was here at the football reunion. It was, I mean, just super positive. The one thing he said to me was, it kills me not to be over there with my soldiers. <laughs> I'm looking at him like, are you kidding me? Like, that's what to him, because his guys are still fighting over in Baghdad, and he's here not with them. And I mean, we just, it was really neat to see him and just to see that he's so positive, he still is. I mean, he does a lot of speaking engagements. So that's overcoming adversity. Just not giving in and figuring out, okay, this happened. It's not what I wanted, but let's keep it going. Let's figure out what I can do to still be successful. He actually just got promoted to full bird colonel. He's still in the Army. They let him stay in. Uh, he was at the Army Navy game last year. Pretty neat. The, to end that story, I was on my way back um, to Iraq, and we got delayed. I was sitting out on the tarmac waiting for a flight in from Kuwait into Baghdad, and I was sitting by a soldier, and I was looking at his patch, and it was this, he was it was a two ID patch, Second Infantry Division, and we're just BSing. I mean, there are a lot of units in Second Infantry Division, and then through the course of our conversation, he said he was a field artilleryman, which is what Greg was. And I said, where are you headed? And he goes, I'm going to Baghdad. And I said, are you in Baghdad? Are you operating? Is your unit in Baghdad? He said, yeah. I said, what unit are you with? And he said, the second and the 32nd field artillery. And I said, hey, so your commander is Greg Gadsden, or Lieutenant Colonel Gadsden. He said, and he just was raving about his leadership. I mean, just they had so much respect for Greg as a leader. He was always out, putting them in a position to be successful. And he said to me, um, Greg's with us every day, and he pulled up his patch. We all wear the, you know, our combat patch and our the American flag. And under the American flag, they had a little tab that said Gatson number 98 that they all wore. He was with them. I mean, every day when they went out, that's inspirational leadership. I mean, that's what gets you through the day. Those type of people that understand who they're leading and what makes and what makes them successful. So. I apologize. I get a little emotional, and so I apologize for that. I mean, there's just certain things and experiences that you've gone through. Um, but anyone have any questions or anything you want me to talk about? I, I have. Uh, I just have one. Like first, yeah. <laughs> first listening to you, we sit around here like before you get here, and we're like, "Yeah, man, it's such a grind, and it's so hard out there." And we're getting no's. So first of all, I've got a whole like <laughs> new perspective on really how easy our job is, you know. Um, but I guess my question is, because you're, you're wired a certain way, I mean, I know just from working with you in the athletic department, it's, you know, get up and boom, get it done. But, how, like, how do, you, how do you inspire, motivate, lead the soldiers that have been under you that maybe they're not quite wired that way? Like, how, how do you keep them moving, going, yeah. getting the job done? 